Today on the show, it is the day after. Yet another loss to the LA Rams. Yet another halftime lead squandered with a poor second half. Who's to blame for the Seahawks' loss this week? What position does it put them in as far as the playoffs go? Is the season over, as some of you have proclaimed on social media? I'll try to put my finger on what I think went wrong yesterday, what it means in the big picture, and also some updates on some important health issues as we go into a short week and the Seahawks get ready to play the 49ers on Thanksgiving. Try to wrap it all up and also give you some comic relief to tie the bow on it at the end. Coming up next on Seahawks Forever. Welcome to the Seahawks Forever podcast. In-depth analysis on everything Seahawks. And now, here's your host, Dan Viennes. Hope this Monday finds all of you well, as well as it can anyway, coming off a Seahawks loss. Especially a loss that looks and feels so familiar, and yet so preventable at the same time. One of those loss that is, losses that are the most difficult to process, which is why I waited until today to do a reaction show. And, and it's, it is so difficult and frustrating because we've seen it before. But maybe at the end of the day, it's just another piece of evidence about what this team is, who they are, and where they're at right now in their development. Thank you for watching, everybody. I am Dan Viennes. You can follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you're listening on audio, hop over to Spotify. For, for 99 cents a month, you can get rid of the ads. You can subscribe for just 99 cents a month. Consider doing that. And if you want to support the show, you can buy me a coffee. Link is in the description. We have some breaking news today, a little bit. Here, let's do this the right way. <laughs> One of these days, I'll hire myself a producer. So uh, we can do this stuff properly. Uh, today on his coach's show, Pete Carroll did say that he expects Geno Smith to play on Thursday. Of course, Geno went out in the third quarter yesterday with that elbow injury after getting hit by Aaron Donald, who absolutely abused Phil Haynes uh, with an inside move on that play. Um, Drew Locke had to come in. We'll, we'll get into that in a moment, how that went. Uh Gino was able, of course, to come in on the last drive, get the Seahawks in position to kick a game-winning field goal. The 54-yarder goes wide right from Jason Myers. Um, and there was some question afterwards about Gino's injury. Sounds like it's a tricep-related injury, which is good news. You know, that when it happened, uh, the worst news would have been structurally uh, some damage to the elbow. Uh, but it's a tricep strain, it sounds like. And Pete said, you know, it's the biggest challenge out there because it's a short week. But he said, quote unquote, he will make it back. Uh, like he kind of slipped that in there. Mike Salk came back with a follow up question. He said, you mean Thursday? He's going to be ready to play. And Pete said, he'll make it back. So we do expect to see Geno Smith. And he looked, you know, he had the one throw to DK on the sideline. He had the big throw, I think the 21 yarder uh, to get him down close and get him in position to kick the potential game winner. He had another out route to DK that was just uh, poorly thrown. And, you know, was it the elbow, the tricep? Was it not? Certainly he'll be able to get treatment over the next few days and, and quiet it down and be good to go on Thursday. Uh, it'd be interesting though, in a short week, like what can you do? It's, you kind of have to put all your eggs in one basket. Can you get, you know, it, normally you would think, well, Let's also try to get Drew Locke more reps in practice this week, but with a short week, that might be tough to do. Um, here's what I'm going to do first, because while I was watching this game, I was taking notes, uh, didn't live stream this one on the PSF app, uh, but I was taking notes on my phone as I went, just things that stood out to me as I went along so that I could reference them when I came back. So I'm going to just kind of go through some of those and then sum up my thoughts at the end. Uh, early on, obviously, you know, this is what makes this loss so frustrating. Very similar to week one. You know, things started out so well. The first drive of the game, I mean, well, first of all, on defense, the Seahawks win the toss again, defer, and force a three and out from the Rams. 
And it was uh, in my notes. My first note is Witherspoon setting the tone. He is everywhere on this first three and out. Uh, he had a he had a pass breakup, uh, and then he had the sack. It turned out to be the only sack of the game for the Seahawks, unfortunately. And then the Seahawks go on offense, and they put together an 88-yard, 14-play drive. Geno Smith goes 7 for 8 for 50 yards and a touchdown to DK Metcalf on the drive. They go, most importantly, 3 for 3 on third down opportunities. You know, they're 30th in the league in third down percentage, just over 30%. That's really bad. It's been a consistent issue. It looked like, okay, we've got some things figured out. How Now, great drive mix, run pass, spreading the ball around, using everyone, good pass protection. Jason Peters gets to start at right tackle. Looked outstanding for the most part in the first half. Aaron Donald, not a factor. Then early on, one of my next notes is we lose Kenneth Walker. We lose Kenneth Walker after just uh, a few carries. And so the Seahawks have to turn then to Zach Charbonnet. Um, early on, here's a note that I have. Penalties in all caps, exclamation points. They had seven of them by the 10-minute mark in the second quarter. Including, and I wrote this down, an illegal shift called on the offense followed by a delay of game. <laughs> so you have you have a penalty called on the offense. You have all that time. You already have a play called. You have all that time to regroup and they get a delay of game coming out of that. Inexcusable. But the offense is controlling the clock early. I think the Rams only had one drive in the first quarter or they had the three and out and then they had a second, second drive. So two truncated drives in the first quarter. Seahawks controlling the clock. Two long drives to start the game. There was only 8.56 left in the half when they completed their second drive and they were up 10-0. It looked like it was in control. They they go into the half up 13-7. to seven. And many of you on social media said exactly what I was thinking. It feels too, I don't want to use the word easy, too smooth. You know, it felt like, okay, we finally figured this one out. And I thought going into this game, I mentioned it last week, that the Seahawks had extra motivation for this one because of the collapse in the first half week one, because of how crushing that was and how uncharacteristic it was of the character of the team. It wasn't that they just flat out got beat physically, but they got beat mentally and psychologically. They looked defeated on the sideline. And I mentioned several times how Pete Carroll just kept referencing the second half performance in that game over and over through week two, three, four. He'd bring it up on his coach's show unprompted, unsolicited. This felt like in that sense, not just a measuring stick, how far has this team come in eight weeks? First chance to compare against the same opponent, but also, you know, could they correct those mistakes and bounce back and, and kind of atone for that second half in week one? And the second half started out okay. The Rams started to move the ball a little bit more consistently but they also started to control the Seahawks pressure. Seahawks only ended up with that one sack. They only had three QB hits in the game, including one that knocked Stafford out for a second. Looked like he was going to have to miss some plays. He didn't. It, it just, where he took a direct shot to the ribs and I don't know how he came back from that, but he's always been a tough SOB. Always have a lot of respect for that guy. He's now 4-0 as a Ram against the Seahawks. Sean McVay now 15 and five against Pete Carroll. That stings. Excuse me. I'm fighting a cold, you guys. So they were forcing the Rams to have to settle for field goals. The defense was still doing okay. And then they come up with a pick at one point. The, the Rams try a flea flicker. They get pressure on Stafford. I think that's the one where he got knocked out. Tariq Woolen picks it off. But this is where the offense started to sputter again. The second half. We've seen a couple examples this, this year of Seahawks being better in the second half than they were in the first half on offense. Carolina. Uh, last week against the Washington Commanders. The Cleveland game. But in this one, the offense just went into a shell. Even before Geno got hurt. They just died. And again, 
I think, in my opinion, it comes back to play mix, play calling and play mix, right? Here's the analogy I have for Shane Waldron right now and how he calls a game. He's a pitcher that has great stuff. He throws 99 with movement. He's got a cutter. And he's got a slider that bites down and away and in on left-handers. He can dot the corners. He has unhittable stuff, but he doesn't know how to pitch. He doesn't have a feel for the game. And great pitchers learn how to sequence. They throw pitch A to set up pitch B. And the great pitchers throw pitch A to set up pitch D. If you get what I'm saying. And this is now the second time in 10 weeks that Raheem Morris has outcoached Shane Waldron in the second half. Both times. Morris's defense made adjustments. Waldron never adjusted back. Here's exactly what I'm talking about. Let's go over the offense of the first five or six drives in the second half by the offense. First drive was a three and out. They come out in the second half. They have the ball to start the half. They have the lead. Three passes. Three and out. When they had run the ball pretty effectively in the first half. You know, Zach Charbonnet had a couple of long runs. Finished with uh, 47 yards, I think, on 15 carries, which ends up not looking that great. But most of that was in the first half. So three and out, three straight passes. Second drive. An eight-play field goal drive, but two runs, six passes. On their third drive, one run, three passes, punt. On their fourth drive, three and out, two passes to one run. Now, this is the one where Geno gets hurt. Drew comes in on third down. And almost, this is how close these, these games are. And, and I'm going to talk about this more at the end, but it's the type of game that Seattle plays a lot of where one play either way could turn the tide. And this is one that people are going to forget about, but as inconsequential as Drew Locke's performance was, he just made no impact unless making no impact is the impact. On this play, he had JSN running wide open on a post uh, or a little a seam route. It wasn't really a post. It was kind of from the slot. It was a seam route. Uh, absolutely wide open with no safety help. It's a touchdown, and JSN just didn't turn around to see the ball. You could put it on Drew a little bit, too. He could have hung it up there a little bit. Uh, it's a touchdown if they connect. The play was there. But still. Then the fifth drive with Drew Locke in because Geno's on the sideline, icing that elbow, trying to work it out. Pass, run on second down pass. In between all of that, <laughs> this is where it gets really frustrating. In between all of that that I just described, the defense is doing their part, man. During that time, the defense held the Rams to 15 plays on four drives. And then the defense finally gave. And the Rams finally, and this is without Cooper Cup. He gets hurt too. He leaves. They go on a nine-play, 68-yard touchdown drive. Now, massive qualifier on this one because it's the one that ended with the Daryl Henderson one-yard touchdown run, which was made possible because Devin Witherspoon's called for pass interference in the end zone in Puka Nakua. It's third and goal at the five. And I'm just going to say this. I don't, I don't, I never say never. I guess here's the example. Uh, 2005, the Seahawks went to their first Super Bowl. There is a huge part of the Seahawks fan base that to this day will tell you the Seahawks were the better team that day. They got screwed by the refs. They lost that game because of some bad calls, to which I have always said consistently, 
No, no, they did not. A couple of those cars calls weren't as bad as you thought they were, first of all. Second of all, we lost that game because Matt Hasselbeck threw a horrible interception late in that game when they were driving to basically put the game away. An inexcusably bad interception. Seahawks had opportunities to win that game despite the calls. There are bad calls in every game. But this this type of call, this is like when you when you talk in basketball terms about how refs should swallow the whistle late in the game unless it's an obvious game-changing call. Devin Witherspoon did not interfere with Puka Nakua. He did not impede his ability to get to the ball at all. Puka Nakua got caught up in traffic and then tripped over his own feet. Devin Witherspoon touched him as he's going through, kind of like a basketball player checking a guy. Didn't push, didn't hold. Took his hands away. Absolutely brutal call. Some people wanted to compare it. uh, Some people from the opposition side wanted to compare it to, well, you know, uh, you know, tit for tat. The week before the PI call against Metcalf really went in your favor against the commanders. To me, that was clear guy getting in, in Metcalf's face in his way, physically pushing him away and impeding his ability to catch the football. Apples to oranges. Uh, it's a call that shouldn't have been, shouldn't have been made. The Rams certainly there from the five would have kicked a field goal. So instead of being within two at 16, 14, it would have been 16, 10 with seven 38 left in the game. Huge call. Absolutely brutal call, but we'll get back to penalties in a minute. No, let's, let's address it now. <laughs> um, it's, it's a, it's a continuing storyline with this team that absolutely has to be fixed. I don't know what the I don't know what the fix is. It absolutely falls on Pete Carroll cuz he's 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 the head coach. He's the guy that controls everything. He oversees everything. Keeps talking about it, how much he emphasizes it. Maybe he emphasizes it too much, I don't know. You know, Greg Bell implied on Twitter uh from the News Tribune that it's because Pete allows his guys to 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 go right up to that edge of competitiveness and and maybe he coaches too much in the gray area of trying to push them to be too competitive. I don't know. I didn't really quite understand what Greg was trying to say there, but 12 penalties for 130 yards and a couple of them were huge. A couple of them were drive sustaining penalties or penalties on offense that killed drives like the one I mentioned earlier. earlier. Um, but that one was absolutely, uh, it was a terrible call. Terrible call. And I don't know, the league doesn't do this as much as they used to, I feel like. It wouldn't surprise me if they came out today or tomorrow and made their statement that it shouldn't have been called. It was a mistake. I wish they wouldn't have screwed it up so badly when it was reviewable a few years ago. Um, inability still to this day to not be able to use technology to its fullest to, to make sure that game-changing, game-impacting type calls are done correctly is uh, beyond me. Really, really unfortunate. So then on the next drive, back to the offense, sixth drive of the half, you have to answer. Rams are within two points now. You have to answer. There's seven and a half minutes left in the game. Drew Locke's still in the game. Guy who gets no reps during the week. You can't prepare your backup quarterback anymore in this league. What does Shane Waldron do? Calls three straight passes. Three and out. Ends in that pick where he tries to go deep and then they tack a penalty onto the end of it. Ends up being essentially as good as a punt. Um, So it doesn't hurt him in that sense. But to Drew Locke, who's not comfortable, three straight passes. Just, (laughs) I'm at a loss for words as to how much, how blatantly Shane Waldron loses faith in the running game in second halves of games. Because you know, he's got Pete Carroll in his ear. It's uh, it's crazy. And then the Rams essentially put the game away after that with a 14-play, 75-yard drive. Another key penalty, but this one comes back to a point that I was going to make. Third and 15 at the Rams' own 48. Uh, there's almost six minutes left in the game, so you stop him here. The Rams are going to punt and try and pin you deep, and you have a chance to ice the game away. Maybe then Geno's ready to come back in. He was warming up at that point. But third and 15 at the Rams, 48. Seahawks force an incompletion. Stafford tries to hit Nakua on the right sideline. Incomplete. 
turnover on downs, or not turnover on downs, force him to punt. Penalty flag, Tariq Woolen called for hands to the face on the opposite side of the field. And this one, we've seen this, we've seen this call multiple times this year. We've seen it against Woolen multiple times. We've seen it in key situations. Pete has talked about how it's an emphasis of the league this year. Reek's got to clean that crap up. That's on Reek. Cannot have that happen. He's, I know he's trying to kick step, you know, and jab the guy in the chest. He's got to, he's got to aim his target low or he's got to be better about that. He just has to. Absolutely brutal. Uh, so they end up taking the lead. 17-16. And, uh, but yeah, Seattle would have had the ball back with five and a half left at that point, up six. Then they finally get the ball back. Gino does come back in, right? They go seven plays, 38 yards, and then the Jason Myers miss. I think for the most part, what I'm seeing from Seahawks fans on social media and online today and last night is pretty reasonable when it comes to Jason Myers. Um, the guy had made two long kicks, three long kicks in the game. He had made five the week before. He'd been nails since he had that bad week two performance, I think. Yeah, it was Detroit that he had the bad game. Uh, you're not going to hit them all. Um, and that that one was tough. That one was tough. Um, I don't blame Jason Myers. Any, anyone who puts this game on Jason Myers, it just has tunnel vision. It's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, self-preservation. It's a defense mechanism. It's also maybe some ignorance. Uh, you, you just don't understand how football works. Like, that's not. Just sometimes you're not going to make the kick. But the Seahawks shouldn't have been in that situation again. Now, initially, I had an issue with the last play call after the shot to DK that got him in position. Um, they go shotgun, pistol formation, or you know, shotgun single back, and Gino just hands it to Charbonnet up the middle. I uh, get stuffed for two yards and then they have to spike it for the long field goal. Felt like I would, if there was enough time on the clock, I'd like to be a little more aggressive there last, uh, similar to what they had to do against the commanders, but less field to work with. Like a short pass over the middle, everybody gets back up. They would have had time to spike the ball. We've seen him do it. We saw, we saw them do it last week in a much lar longer yardage situation, but I have to excuse them of that because Pete said that today that Gino's headset went out on that play. He couldn't hear the play call from the sideline. He had to make the decision at that, you know, in the moment. And he says he, he felt comfortable running the football there. And then Pete said they just didn't block it right. Uh, they missed uh, an assignment and, uh, and the crease wasn't there. You know, another three, four yards might make all the difference there, right? Um, and so the Seahawks lose and they drop to six and four on the season, two and three on the road. Now, uh, again, leading 13, seven at half in both games outscored. Now I combined 33 to three in the second halves of those games. And you talk about Sean McVay owning Pete Carroll, Raheem Morris owning Shane Waldron. My biggest problem in this game is, other than run past mix and just abandoning the run in the second half. Uh, was a, a once again, just the complete non-usage of the tight ends. Uh, I'm just going to stop talking about how the Seahawks have one of the most talented tight end groups in the league because it doesn't matter if you don't use them. Two catches for 13 yards between Noah Fant and Will Disley. Nothing for Colby Parkinson. Those late game situations, especially with a guy like Drew Locke coming cold off the bench, that's the kind of safety valve I want to see. You know, Waldron gets so much praise from some of the analysts out there and some of the YouTubers. And, you know, we saw Colt McCoy do it. We've seen TJ O'Sullivan do it and, and Brian Baldinger and some other guys of play design, how he uses motion and deception in his formations. None of it seems to ever result in easy completions to tight ends. And yet we see other teams do it over and over and do it to us. There's a game that will never not stick in my head. 
And it's the game Russell's rookie year where the Seahawks lost in the divisional round in Atlanta and got eliminated from the playoffs in his rookie year. The game that y'all hear about, you know, as he's running in the tunnel, he's talking about, you know, that's the last time we're going to lose this early. We're going to, you know, we're on the verge of something. Can't, can't wait to get started. All of that that lives on in lore with the Legion of Boom era. You remember the game Zach Miller had in that game? I think it was top of my head, something like 12 catches for 110, 120. He just, the Falcons couldn't stop it. And so Russ just kept going back to it. Just Zach, little drag routes over the middle. I I just, I don't know why it's ignored. And I, uh, I will be pounding the table this off season for us not to spend any significant salary cap money on tight ends. If that's, if that's going to be their usage. Draft guys, sign free agents that are, you know, second tier, third tier. Uh, don't give guys like Will Disley $9 million a year. Don't re-sign Noah Fant if he's got a market. Um, I just don't get it. I really don't get it. Um, so I talked during the week about how important this game was because of what's coming up. In 28 days, now over the span of the next 28 days, the Seahawks play the 49ers, then the Cowboys, then the 49ers again, and then the Eagles. The three best teams in the NFC, hands down. Bar none. No question. Getting to seven and three would have bought you a cushion in the playoff race. Even if you were to dispose of or dismiss the possibility that they could even win the division. Because they still would have been tied for first place if they had won this game. And that would have been a, a sexy headline heading into Thursday. Um, especially because of what happened around the rest of the league. Everyone else essentially that the Seahawks are in the wild card race with lost. Getting to seven and three would have bought you such a cushion. You could have even made the argument that they could have gone 0 and four over this next stretch to drop to seven and seven and still been in really good position to get a wild card when you look at their three final games against Tennessee, Pittsburgh, and Arizona. It still <laughs> isn't that daunting of a task to get to the wild card in the NFC. Here is their competition. The Vikings are the other six-win team. Then the Saints have five wins, and the Packers, Rams, Falcons, Bucks, and Commanders all have four wins apiece. Although, of course, the Rams would own the tiebreaker against the Seahawks. The Seahawks would own the tiebreaker against the Commanders. Um, it's crazy. Can they win one of these next four games? Someone said this morning that coming back to beat the 49ers on national TV on Thursday, on Thanksgiving Day, four days after losing a disappointing game they should have won against the Rams, would be the most Pete Carroll thing ever. And I've said this before, I'd never, ever count out a Pete Carroll team. And sometimes I trust them more going into a, a matchup that seems unwinnable than I do in a game that should be quote unquote easy. Somehow, some way, I, I feel like they're, they'll find a way to win one of these next four. Somehow. Maybe it's one of the 49er games just because of that familiarity and the short turnaround and fluky things happen. But ever since they lost three in a row going into the bye, Brock Purdy looked mortal. Man, they look immortal and unbeatable at this point. They look far and away like the best team in the NFC. And since the Ravens lost last week, they look like the best team in football. And Brock Purdy looks, again, elite, erasing any questions that there might have been going into the bye. He goes for over 300 yards, three touchdowns yesterday. In one of my fantasy leagues, I had him on my bench. Still turned out fine. Still won by a lot um, with Justin Fields as my starter. But he had 47 fantasy points. <laughs> uh, granted, that league has a very, very generous scoring system for their quarterbacks. But even in my other league that's more realistic, more along ESPN standard lines, he had 33 or 34 fantasy points. Uh, the 49ers do get some really bad news today. They, they lose their outstanding safety, Hufanga, to an ACL injury. He's out for the rest of the year, but that defense is still so stacked. And that offense, and Brandon Ayuk in a contract year, continues to produce. You know, up until this point, he's been that guy 
that had all the tools, showed flashes, but never really put the numbers together. Like if you've, to use as an example, again, if you've had him in fantasy football, he's been kind of a, kind of a frustrating own, right? He has a massive day yesterday. He looks like he's going to get big time elite money. There's even a report today that the team's going to prioritize re-signing him over Chase Young, who they just acquired a couple weeks ago this off season, uh, cause they're going to have some tough contract decisions coming up. Um, quickly want to address this. Uh, there's a lot of, again, as there always will be for the rest of his time here in Seattle, anytime there's a bad loss, or, there's a lot of fire Pete sentiment, sentiment out there. I think at the end of the day, it's probably a very small percentage of Seahawks fandom, but it's a loud percentage. And to that, I would say this, and, and I'll probably do an entire show on this coming up soon. Um, but just to touch on it, the fire Pete sentiment, right? We, we kind of talked about this philosophy in the show I did a couple weeks ago about Geno Smith versus Drew Locke, the people that thought that they should make a change. It's always the mystery and the sexiness of the unknown, the possibility of what could be with something new. And there's always the upcoming hot head coaching candidates, right? Here's some names for you. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six names of guys that in the last couple of years have been hired because they were the stud, hot coordinators that were going to be great head coaches that were in demand that teams were fighting over. So they get these big, huge contracts as rookie head coaches. Matt Eberfluss, Brian Dable, Robert Sala, Brandon Staley, Arthur Smith. And I'm even throwing Mike Vrabel's name into that because he started off hot, was considered a superstar young head coach. Maybe he's going to go to New England and succeed Bill Belichick someday. Those six combined this season, 21 and 41, 33% winning percentage. They're all considered on the hot seat, may all be fired after this season. Be careful what you wish for. The culture that Pete has built, the way they've rebuilt this roster in the last two years after trading away a franchise quarterback from a roster that was already flawed, thin, and depleted and built it back up to the point that I think someone said it really well this morning as well. I like giving credit where credit's due. I wish I had remembered or written down the name of who, where I saw this from. So the Seahawks are two plays away from being eight and two. Right? One play in Cincinnati and one play yesterday. He also cited that they're two plays away from being four and six. You can make arguments that two of their wins that they pulled out in the last second and might have lost. So at six and four, they're right where they belong. I think that's a fairly accurate assessment. That's just kind of the NFL though, right? We talk about that all the time. And this is a team that because of some shortcomings that there are, I believe, in how the offense is coordinated, that if they're going to win this the way they're going to have to win, they don't have any one thing that they dominate at. Things have to be working together. The pass rush wasn't there yesterday. And so maybe you need to come up with a couple of turnovers. They just had the one on the, on the ball that Stafford got hit on. The offense faltered in the second half. If, if they could have leaned on that running game a little bit more, right? But Shane Waldron doesn't have enough confidence that he can dominate with that running game at this point to lean on it. Is that because the running game isn't where it should be or is it because he just needs to have more faith? And it's a, it's a shortcoming he, he has. The good teams find a way even when they're limited. The Rams are a great example. The one, one of the things they have on each side of the ball is they have Aaron Donald and they have Matt Stafford. At the end of the day, those two guys made enough plays when they had to to beat us, and that was the difference in the game. And maybe it's as simple as if Gino doesn't get hurt, they win the game because he comes up with a play or two in there. He was playing well. And he was playing well for the second week in a row in a way that led me to believe that, that we could have a growing amount of confidence in him heading into this next four-game stretch. He was much more, if I go back in my notes, I know I'll find it. 
on this first drive. Gino looked decisive and confident. He bounced back from that JSN catch that was called back on the sideline where it was reviewed. Absolutely beautiful throw that JSN needs to learn to, to get that first foot in. He looked decisive and confident. Whatever it was that was plaguing him in that Cincinnati game and even the Cleveland game at times where he's just missing wide open guys and hesitating and his internal clock just wasn't, wasn't clicking fast enough. Uh, he seems to have corrected that. So maybe it was just the difference in Geno Smith not being out there. But also, in a small sample size, those of you that were crying for Drew Locke to come in and save the day a couple of weeks ago, you got your wish. And he didn't, he didn't make a single positive play when one play might have saved this game. But again, it does appear as if Geno Smith will be under center again on Thursday night. Thanksgiving night, 520 kickoff time against the San Francisco 49ers. Obviously a huge game. We're looking for an epic Pete Carroll-led Seattle Seahawks bounce back this week, aren't we? Uh, just as anything can happen in the Rams-Seahawks rivalry, so too anything can happen in the 49ers-Seahawks rivalry. Can't it? We shall see. Um, <laughs> between now and then, I am going to link up with Rob Guerrera, who does such a fantastic job of covering things from the 49ers side and has uh, before and has joined me on the show before. We'll be getting together Wednesday to get his view of how he feels about the 49ers heading into this matchup. How do you feel? Let me know in the comments. Uh, if the Seahawks and 49ers played 10 times, how many times do you think the Seahawks would beat them right now? And then we will talk again, certainly, after that. Follow me on Twitter at Seahawks Forever. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel and on any audio podcast platform that you prefer as well. And again, if you want ad-free audio uh, episodes, you can get those on Spotify for just 99 cents a month. Until next time, talk to you in a couple of days. Forever and always, go Hawks.